yeah, I think it's good to go. Oh, so you unmute yourself? Uh, you, you unmute yourself, I think. Hello, can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Perfect. All right. So um, I wanted to just mention today, I will mostly do lecture style, so with pen, and uh, so online pen like this. And uh, if uh, you're welcome to take notes in real time, so if you want to get out your paper and pen, um, this would be a good time to do so. I'm going to start stop at a few points for questions, but in addition, if you have other questions, you can at any point you can type them into chat or wait for those parts when I stop and uh, ask for questions. So I will begin. Um, I should mention that this is an introduction. I'll start with an introduction to ZX calculus. So I'm going to type this parts. And um, this will be based off the basic ZX calculus for students and professionals, um, which is a series of a very short lecture notes um, released by uh, Bob Kuka, who is chief scientist of Continuum and formerly a professor at University of Oxford, who um, I helped review this uh, lecture notes. And this was a uh, guest lectures for Arthur Eckert's course um, at University of Oxford. So I will also mention, um, we'll start with some definitions of ZX calculus. Um, I will give some informal definitions, but I just want to give the example that there are multiple ways to define it, depending on how your background or intent in using it is. So the very first would be that uh, ZX calculus Um, could be considered a quantum graphical calculus. So this is some diagrammatic formalism um, arising from categorical quantum mechanics. And so um, this was an attempt to formulate quantum mechanics axiomatically using category theory. And so more specifically, uh, the technical terms, and we'll only say this once and not need to know the meaning, is that this would be uh, dagger symmetric from um, um, commutative uh, and special Frobenius algebras, interacting uh, Frobenius algebras. And each of these words has a very specific technical definition as to why the calculus works. However, I will say we won't need to know any of this category theory, and in fact, the um, so that's that's no problem. But it's just to know that uh, that this gives the correctness of the diagrams due to oops, this is what gives the correctness of these diagrams and why we are able to use this formalism as we are. Uh, I'm not sure why the bullet points are not working. Here we go. Okay, another definition could be that you it is a means for circuit optimization and quantum circuit optimization. And indeed, uh, the earlier ways of developing quantum, uh, developing the calculus was the intents of quantum circuit optimization and also um, conversions uh, from between the circuit model and measurement-based quantum computing. So the, especially the earliest years of quantum uh, graphical calculi were developed for these main, um, these main application domains. You could also have considered uh, ZX calculus as an, axiomatization, an ax axiomatization of qubit quantum mechanics, uh, purely in terms of uh, generators which you could so diagrammatic elements which you compose for example like legos 
and then you can interpret them, each diagram as linear maps, and then have all equalities between linear maps formulated in terms of these rewrite rules, which we'll get into more detail in. So, so um, uh, oh, there's also PyZX. So this is a Python tool for the ZX calculus. And so this can be used in quantum programming, uh, as mentioned before, quantum circuit optimization, and a bunch of other applications. Um, I will also mention more broadly that ZX calculus is only one of um, many quantum graphical calculi that's in a families of quantum graphical calculi. And so we'll discuss some of the other quantum graphical calculi in the, at, towards the end of this hour as well. So to start, um, we can first go through some generic process theories. So let's for now draw our diagrams from bottom to top. Let's say we have, uh, so we can have wires. Let's say this is one wire and this wire will have a type. So in, for our cases, we're just gonna think about qubits. And so each wire corresponds to information traveling on one qubit. So just like how in the circuit model, where you have uh, quantum gates that are applied to states that then you do measurements, this, every single wire in the circuit model is a qubit and so therefore, we're also referring to wires here as qubits. Um, we'll stick to qubits for most of this, most of not all of this talk. Um, so more generally, uh, in a process theory, you can draw the uh, process um, as a diagram. So you could say that if we're reading these diagrams from bottom to top, if you're baking a cake first, you can make dough. You can um, knead dough, and then you could. Then you could bake the dough. Oh, maybe skipping a few steps here, but you get the idea. But this is if you were to bake cookies or cake or something like that, then uh, your inputs to this neat dough box could be like the eggs or milk or sugar, baking soda, these things. And then, then you would put that dough mixture into your oven um, and ba then bake it. And then output, you have a cake here. So more just four different situations of you have boxes or other um, things within your diagram that have possible different number of inputs and outputs. So these fours, we're gonna, these four things we're gonna consider states, uh, gates, states, effects, and numbers. So gates have at least one input and at least one output. Um, instead of gates, we could just call these maps. That may be a bit, a bit more general to not confuse with unitary gates. So let's just call these maps. States have at least one, uh, states have zero inputs and at least one output. Effects are just um, have zero outputs and at least one input. And numbers have zero inputs and zero outputs. Uh, I'm just using the normal notation of quotation marks to not have to rewrite things that we already repeated. So how this may look like diagrammatically, um, um, think of states, we could draw them, let's just say this way, states. Let's just say our state is ket psi, for example. And this dot 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 just means um, there could be one or more wires here. You can have effects, which let's just draw it like this. 
And uh, you'll notice if you compose a psi and a phi like this, if you compose a state in an effect, that's like taking a in inner product, so a bracket. If you're more familiar with bracket notation, um, that this could be more comfortable that you get that you get a number out. If not, uh, if, you, if you're still new to bracket notation, that's okay. We won't use it here um, for now. But um, you can see that this whole diagram, which is an a, a state followed by an effect, uh, has zero inputs and zero outputs, and so this thing must be a number. So in bracket notation, this would be that this kit psi uh, bra bra five composed with kit psi is a number. And uh, more, lastly, we have maps, which is a map. Um, we'll draw it as this trapezoid looking thing. Um, it has at least one input and at least one output. Um, this uh, choice of drawing it as a trapezoid in this way uh, is just by convention. So if you look at some textbooks on quantum graphical calculi, uh, for example, picturing quantum processes and the currently in progress but upcoming SQL picturing quantum software. These textbooks uh, choose to draw this as trapezoid, and it's uh, quite well defined. So we can discuss that part in a, in a few seconds. So the main uh, important part about quantum graphical calculi is that is composition. So there's two types of composition, just like you have in the circuit model. It would be a sequential composition, which we've already shown an example of is this bake and knead dough example where you first knead dough and then you bake it. Um, you can't reverse the order. Uh, so that's that's an example of sequential composition because you're composing something one after another. The other type of composition is parallel composition. So if you have two wires side by side, you're implicitly uh, there's a tensor product between these two. So it's actually this it's actually this left wire taking a tensor product with this white right wire. But um, in diagrams, just this empty space uh, between wires and boxes is just uh, implicitly this tensor product. Um, in category th from the category theory, this is made correct, but um, but we don't need to worry about that. So um, so um, you can just like you can tensor wires, you can also take a tensor product of boxes. So in let's say in the circuit model, you're doing an X gate tensor with identity gate, then uh, they're side by side, and implicitly you know they're happening at the same time. So, um, we, so we do have that um, any diagram, we can interpret or it or evaluate it to a linear map. In the case of qubits, this is just Hilbert spaces on C2. And uh, so, so um, what we're really interested in using this calculi for is that you have, if you have any two diagrams, they could be circuits, they could be any quantum computation, any linear map in any number, on any number of qubits. Um, if you have any two diagrams that have interpreted to the same linear map, we want to only use the rules of the calculus to derive that they're equal. So for example, um, you can show, um, yeah, actually it's be easier to draw this part. So for example, if we have circuit, if you have like X, um, if you first do the I gate on the second qubit and then do the X gate on the first qubit, um, just by dragging, so sliding these boxes along these wires like this, you could show that this is mathematically equal to this, where these two diagrams are the same up to this sliding these boxes along the wires. You can also uh, have more generally some wacky things such as, uh, so I will define what this what these operations are later, but um, for some real number alpha. Okay. 
So these two diagrams are the same except for the except for bending these wires, crossing and bending these wires. So this is, in other words, this is called the only connectivity matters paradigm. And um, we generally like it if our uh, if our calculi have this property. Connectivity matters. So um, if you interpret both sides of this equation as a linear map over qubits, you will get the same result because these two diagrams have the same connectivity. However, they might have different physical interpretations, say as a quantum computation and as a physical system, etc. But as a protocol, but um, in any case, uh, the if you compute what is the matrix or linear map that corresponds to both these diagrams, um, for example, by contributing the matrices of each part and then composing them, like by matrix multiplication or tensoring them, if they're parallel and matrix multiplication if they're sequential, then you do uh, you should get the exact same result. So the last part that I get to cover before we get into the specific specific calculus for the ZX calculus is that we can talk about um, uh, different transformations you can do on linear maps. Specifically, the reason why the convention is convenient to choose a trapezoid for any linear maps is because um, if you have, a, let's just say a function f, we're going reading, still reading from bottom to top in this case, if you take uh, every single input and bend it into an output, and if you take every output and bend it into an input like this, this is, um, imagine because only connectivity matters, you could pull the string straight and then you would get a 180 degree rotation like this. So um, in other words, this is the transpose of the map F, because if you take any the matrix of the map F and then you take the transpose, you're actually just swapping which is the input and which is the output. In particular, if F is if F is just the identity operation, let's just say on a single wire, then um, then you get the equation that this thing is equal to this thing, <laughs> which uh, you may have seen if you've seen Rick and Morty um, in the snake episode. Then this is part of this is this is just on the blackboard, even though they kind of that equation is actually wrong. <laughs> um, so um, so that's transpose. Transpose is in diagramic notation is uh, should be just rotation by 180 degrees. So we also have um, complex conjugation, which uh, by convention is of f, let's say, uh, I'll just draw it below. So this is transpose. Um, complex conjugation is a horizontal reflection. So if you have, um, in particular, if you do the CPM construction, so this is uh, from Selinger, this is the completely positive maps construction. So you know how you take, if you take an outer product of a, of a ket, then you get this ket in a bra. Then uh, this, for example, any, any density matrix, so any, uh, any quantum state, even mixed ones, um, can be expressed as a sum over some coefficients and uh, with this kind of notation where these this is a cat this is a bra and this is their outer product and then you're summing over um, different coefficients i where this is the coefficient for that term so any quantum any single qubit or multi-qubit quantum state can be expressed in this kind of factorization and um, any map, for example, you can then write as in diagrammatic notation as this, where you have some number of discardings in the middle. Process is textbook. If you're dealing with just pure maps, then you only have this. You only can. Um, there's these two parts are these two halves are disconnected, so you can just compose 
um, you can just compose in parallel the pure map with the complex conjugate. So in, in any case, um, in the pure case, uh, you have that this whole part goes away. In fact, you only have a single ket and, it, and an outer product with its bra. So you, your summation is just over a single term. So in fact, summing over just nothing. Um, you, don't, there's this, you don't need the summation. Um, so uh, that's kind of a sneak peek, but uh, we don't need to worry about that for, for uh, maybe possibly a bit too in depth for this part of the introduction for this introduction, but it's nice to know that this is out there that we can still express any mixed state quantum mechanics with with this. We are just um, many applications you can do without needing to do this. And the final part, the final possible orientation of this F box of just any arbitrary linear map would be taking its complex conjugate transpose. So uh, this is also just coincides with the adjoint. Um, So if you take the conjugate transpose of any arbitrary map f, then you get, um, if you both do first a transpose, so 180 degree rotation, and then take the conjugate, which is a horizontal reflection, then that's the same as if you first took the horizontal reflection and then rotated 180 degrees. So in other words, this conjugate transpose is well defined. And it doesn't matter if you first conjugate, then transpose, or the first transpose, then conjugate. And what you get is a vertical reflection. So you get this. And in particular, um, for any isometry f, you have that if you first do f and then you do f transpose, Then you get the identity, and this is uh, true if f is an isometry, aka um, f dagger after f is equal to the identity. So to sum up these operations, um, you have if you have any map, any linear map f, then you take. Um, you can do the horizontal reflection. So complex conjugation will give you this one. And vertical reflection, so adjoint, will give you this one. And if you then uh, do the horizontal um, reflection again, you get this. And if you add one, you get this. But more importantly, um, this is transpose, which is 180 degree rotation, and so is this. So in other words, this choice of choosing this trapezoid as a convention uh, was quite helpful because it does capture all the possible basic operations on these linear maps. And um, I'll stop here for some questions for now. There was a question from Tianchi. Um, in the chat that said, can you also use this to represent mixed states? Um, yes, so mixed state quantum mechanics is uh, possibly understudied, but it is complete. So I will define what is completeness in a bit, but uh, it's, it's um, uh, we can do um, prove all equalities between mixed state quantum, uh, uh, mixed state quantum mechanics on qubits, any number of qubits um, using just using just uh, this graphical calculi. So to continue, um, we can cover uh, the basic definitions of the ZX calculus. <laughs> it's actually only two definitions we really need in terms of linear maps. And so um, let's notate, first let's notate uh, green. Um, actually, this is called green in convention, but um, if I'm drawing in black and white, I'll just use a white spider. Uh, so this is the Z spider. 
So we have M inputs and N output legs. Here, M and N has at least there. They can be zero or more. And this is defined to be um, ket zero to the power of uh, tensor power of N, and then bra zero to the tensor power of M plus uh, ket one. Uh, with the same definition. So you can see that if you have an input that is in, consider your input is all in the computational basis. So zero, either ket zero or ket one. If they're all zero, then you output all zeros. If they're all one, then you output all ones. And if you have anything other than that, so any combination of zeros and ones such that it's not all zeros and not all ones, then you just get the number zero, which like this whole, you annihilate basically. Um, so first of all, this is definitely not unitary, um, um, but we can build all unitaries from things that look like this. So more, uh, we need to just tweak this definition a little bit, it's just that we need to add this alpha here. This alpha here, alpha is a real number between 0 and 2 pi, and uh, it's defined this way. So this e to the i alpha uh, applies a phase if the input is all ket ones and uh, doesn't apply the phase if the input's all ket zeros. And this e to the i alpha actually is such that if you have a single um, input and output with a phase alpha, then this equals the matrix like this, um, which you may recognize as your normal z phase gate. So for example, if alpha is pi, then you get diag 1 minus 1, which is the qubit z gate. So I will, let's see, I'll zoom out a bit so you can, if you're taking notes, you can still see this part. On the other hand, we can do the same thing, except we have another color. Uh, conventionally, this is red, but if you're this black and white, I just follow the convention that this is black. Um, And this is the same thing, except um, the definition is now with respect to x basis states rather than z basis states. So these states are eigen, these are the eigen states, so eigenvectors of the qubit x gate instead of, of the qubit z gate. Beta is also in um, 0, 2 pi. And so if beta here just happened to be the angle pi, then this exactly is the qubit x gate. And in fact, these two definitions are all we need to be able to represent any linear map uh, on any number of qubits, so any state measurement, um, unitary, this, etc. So um, here it's clear we can get z and x phase gates, but the, we can also show we can get, the, for example, the c0 gate. So, um, so this copies, this is the copy operation, but I'll say more specifically, uh, you can't have cloning in quantum mechanics, but this copies uh, ket 0 and ket 1, so z basis states. So uh, you may notice the ket 0 is just drawn like this. Um, now I'm drawing from left to right. Uh, the reason is because I want to draw it in the circuit model. But actually because only connectivity matters as long as we know, uh, for at least for this calculus, um, it's fine that uh, we can s switch our conventions as long as you know what you're doing. Um, as long as you keep track of which is your inputs and outputs. So um, if we're now looking at left to right, uh, so this this you can see that uh, it has one input reading from left to right and two outputs. And looking at this definition, we see that if the input was ket zero, then uh, we get two ket zeros output. And if the input was ket one, 
um, by convention, if this label wasn't there, then alpha is zero. Um, if this label was cat one, then we get two cat ones alpha. And um, we also have um, XOR. Oops. Uh, my screen just jumped. There we go. We're back. So we also have XOR. And this is looks like this. So um, so this takes in two inputs. If the input, so let me just draw. Uh, um, any map is just defined by what it does on every state in a basis. So in this case, a computational basis. Let's say that this is a pi and this is b pi, um, where a and b are either zero or one. Then by the rules of the calculus, um, uh, I can show the rules in a sec, the more general rules. But um, this is the, an application of the rule that's called the fusion rule. And this is the most impossible. Well, you can argue which rule is most important, but I think this, this is the most important one. So uh, this is, if you have any um, same color spiders, connected by at least one wire in the middle, let's just say this one, for example, then you can fuse them together and then add up their phases. So this is a phase of zero, this is a phase of a pi. And so you, therefore you get uh, a pi. So this is what you get if you fuse these ones. And then you can repeat the fusion again with this to get a plus b pi, like that. So um, what this corresponds to is that this is either ket0 or ket1, and this is either you're applying an x-gate or not applying an x-gate. Um, and then this is, uh, because a and b are both bits, they're either 0 or 1, then what you're going to get is either 0 pi, 1 pi, or 2 pi. But 2 pi modulo 2 pi is just 0. So, so you just get either 0 or 1 pi, which means you get either ket0 or ket1. So this is uh, XOR because it's just addition modulo 2. And where that brings us is that the C0 gate just looks like this. Um, for example, you can think of the C0 gate as first doing this tensor identity and then doing um, identity tensor this thing. So we can still express these multi-qubit operations, um, unitaries using these non-unitary things. So for example, if you were to plug in uh, a pi, so either ket0 or ket1, if a is 0 or 1 respectively, into this, by um, this copy rule, you get that this is equal to this. And by fusion, then here you get that this is a pi and that this is a pi. So this means that uh, if you plug in the either ket0 or ket1 into the control of a C0 gate, then either you're going to get um, you're going to get the same value that was input to that control as the control output, but you're also going to get an X gate on the target if and only if the control was ket ket1 and uh, identity on the target if control was ket0. We can do the same with um, applying uh, um, a z, so an, uh, an x basis state, so a z spider that looks like this. So if b is 0, then this is the ket plus state, and if b is 1, then this is the ket minus state. And um, in fact, because only connectivity matters, we could have also just drawn it this way because we could bend, we could just bend the wire in the middle um, to be the other direction. That's no problem. So this, we copy through here again. Uh, the copy rule holds uh, independent of, um, we can take any rule and invert the colors in qubit zx calculus and that's still fine. And this is because of this symmetry that we have between the z and x spaces and the way we define the calculus. So we copy first and then we fuse again and we get the same outcome but in the opposite color. So this shows that the, um, 
what the, what's the C naught gate, so this gate, which is equal to this gate, um, what the C naught gate does when you have a Z basis state as the control um, is symmetric in the sense that if you also uh, get the same behavior if you have the X an X basis state as the target. Um, you can just get the behave, same behavior except in the opposite direction. So in fact, uh, thinking about the C naught gate classically, so in terms of zero and one states, doesn't just tell you the whole picture. So I can uh, stop for some questions and then um, I think that, yeah, I can stop for some questions and then continue to show some applications. Um, you can also write, ask your questions after as well. Um, so no worries, you don't have to come up with questions on the spot. So I think maybe, maybe, um, maybe now I can go ahead to applications and just get some idea, but we can come back to more examples of the calculus in action if, that, if you guys would like that. So, uh, I could probably skip this slide. This is about cutids, but we can come back to the definition of cutids if you guys are interested. Okay, so. Um, as an initial motivation of the calculus, perhaps the most important this property of the calculus is that you don't need to keep having more and more equations that this circuit is equal to this other circuit. So for example, um, in the past literature, there could be lots of equations of this circuit being equal to this other circuit. And a lot of circuit optimization would consist of finding these kinds of pattern matching in order to see when you could apply these rules and simplify your circuit to reduce gate count and other uh, circuit cost metrics. And so these rules would just keep going and it wouldn't know when it would end. Um, and it was an open problem whether or not you could even possibly express all of the possible equalities of quantum circuits uh, in a finite set of rules. So do we need infinitely many equations to express all the possible equalities of all quantum circuits on any number of qubits? Especially it can get difficult because you could have these parameterized rules. So these rules in themselves could have these variables such as U, which means any unitary, or you could have different phase gates and uh, parameterized quantum circuits. And so it became very non-obvious whether or not this was possible to do. Um, and the first results that succeeded in using a finite set of rules to express any equalities of any quantum being able to express any qualities of any linear maps on any number of qubits was uh, this paper in 2018 and a similar paper around independently, independently in the same around the same time. Um, so this is uh, using the qubit ZW calculus and the qubit ZX calculus and both of these having a complete rule set which they could prove was sufficient to derive any qualities of any linear maps on qubits. And in fact, uh, although at the time the complete rule sets was very complicated and very hard to use, but nowadays these rules are uh, very concise and I think each of the rules is quite intuitive. So uh, one, this is one, two, three, four, five, six. This is seven rules and these seven rules you can use to do any equalities of any linear maps on any number of qubits. Um, uh, so all of this table from this 2018 paper, um, has the least number of rules, but I find that adding, re-axiomatizing in terms of these eight rules, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, is slightly more intuitive because I think each of these could be explained. So we've already seen this spider fusion rule up here and this copy rule. This Z and X of phase gate, but with phase of zero, is just identity. This rule is also quite straightforward. Um, this rule on the top right is that this specific inner product is equal to the number one, um, but it's not 
um, in practice, we don't need to deal with these numbers very much because if we're dealing with quantum uh, quantum computation uh, that involves calculating different amplitudes, then the, the software will take care of this and we're doing these kind of proofs by hand. We usually don't need to take care of these, except notice when they are the zero, <laughs> when, when you get the number zero. And um, we can explain this rest of these as well. So this, and now I can cover this B rule. This B rule is that if you, uh, let's say we read from top to bottom, it doesn't quite matter here, but let's say we're reading from top to bottom. If you first copy uh, two different inputs and then uh, there are computational base states, and then you take the XOR of each of one out, one of each of these outputs, it's the same as if you first took the XOR and then copied the result of the XOR. So that has a simple interpretation. Um, the, this one here is just saying that this H rule is also called color change. Uh, and this is the, this, uh, yellow square is the discrete quantum Fourier transform. In other words, in qubits, it's just, we just call it the Hadamard gate. And this changes between eigenbases of the Z and X operators. So this means that if you apply an H gate to each of the input and output legs of a spider of one color, then it's equal to the same face spider of the other color. These are called spiders because it's just a circle with any number of legs, zero or more. So this, this uh, calculus lets you work with these Z and X bases quite uh, consistently because your Hadamard gate is just changing the colors. Um, and your Hadamard gate itself is just has this ZX diagram, but up to a global phase, it's just a green, it's just a S gate rotation, so a green pi over two uh, Z phase rotation about the Z axis of the block sphere, then uh, a pi over two rotation about the X axis of the block sphere, and then the Z axis again. So um, <laughs> I have an upcoming tutorial that explains this uh, Hadamard gate. Uh, of it, of it um, more clearly with the block sphere and the unit circle. So in the last rule on this right hand side is that uh, this is, this is uh, it just so happens because single qubit unitaries are just rotations on a sphere, a 3D real sphere on the surface of the sphere. So if you rotate by the Z axis of the sphere, a certain angle, and then the X axis, and then the Z axis again, that's the same as if you chose, if you could always find three angles to be equal to this first rotation that's about the X axis, and then the Z axis, and then the X axis. So this rule captures this <laughs> relations of these complicated rotations of the block sphere uh, with these um, with simply just three rotations alternating between Z and X axis of the block sphere. So um, uh, I'm checking right now. I think there aren't questions, but um, if you have questions, do just put them in the chat. Uh, hi, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, thanks. Uh, Leah, thank you for uh, the nice, interesting talk. I just have a very uh, general question about this, uh, this formalism. So uh, in terms of like computation or um, numerics, is there any uh, advantage for this uh, formalism over uh, other, like say, tensor network based uh, approaches? Yeah, so um, so uh, first of all, this is a formalism. So there's specific algorithms you can do within this formalism, but it's kind of weird to say if the, is the circuit model better than uh, tensor networks or with other, other kinds of formalisms. It's, you can't say that the formalisms are computationally better, but you could say that it's easier to find uh, optimizations or represent them more naturally in these different formalisms. So specifically, um, uh, you, any circuit model diagram, you can uh, easily rewrite to this notation, but you can have a bit more expressibility. So you could also intercovert with measurement-based quantum computing, for example. You could also think of the ZX calculus as a tensor network itself, because it's uh, you can express any um, this spider rule up here, this top left uh, rule, this is um, just fusion of two nodes in your tensor network graph. So you can think yeah. of it as a tensor network with a bit more specific to quantum B 
features that has that's baked into the rules of the calculus. Okay, I see. I see. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. So, um, yeah, here, a, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, just curious on the uh, verification side of the work. So, is there any like verified operations, the correctness, something like that? Uh, because I know some of our previous uh, speakers, they talk about the verification of this uh, circuit-based model, gate-based gate model, so, right. Yeah, so here I just navigated to the zxcalculus.com publications page. So every paper that involves at least one ZX diagram or other quantum graphical calculus diagram is supposed to be listed on this page unless we did not find it or they didn't report it. But uh, um. So the one that came to mind immediately for me would be physics, which is a vision for verifying the ZX calculus, specifically with formal verification. So this paper is about um, using the cock proof resistant in order to verify each of the operations of the ZX diagram. It's particularly uh, uh, promising to verify just to verify ZX calculus because if you have any algorithm that's only ex re expressed expressed using ZX calculus rewrite rules, then the verification of this program that you wrote using just these operations um, just boils down to verifying uh, these, these rules and any program that uses these rules mm -hmm. in some order. So it's okay, nice cool. to know yeah. that. Yeah, I will have a look at that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is yeah. some ongoing research. Um, it would be Professor Robert Rand at UChicago is working actively on this. Mm. Um, this is quite a cool website. So you can uh, search, uh, you can search different keywords like working on quantum error correction. So, for example, so then you could just look this up, and you'll see many examples of papers that fit mm -hmm. these keywords. Or I'm also researching Qubits, and <laughs> you can just mm -hmm. search it up. This it's quite simple. There's also a Discord server that you could uh, open to anyone that you could join via this webpage, and also a Python open source package for ZX Calculus. Mm -hmm. And we just released the Qdits version last week. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. So um, I can probably I only have five slides left, but I think this is a nice teaser. <laughs> um, I will say that the applications of ZX calculus I'm presenting are a bit more biased towards my PhD research topics, but um, you can see on zxcalculus.com, there's many, there's over 100, I think 150 papers on this topic, so I can't go through all of them for sure, but um, maybe the most, if I had to condense uh, this kind of overview of quantum graphical calculi into a few very short slides, maybe I would focus on the fact that for qubit quantum graphical calculi, you only have three main ones. Um, so specifically, three quantum graphical calculi that have this bioalgebra rule that we see this B rule right here, where my cursor is. So instead of having Z, which is these green spiders, and X, which is these red spiders, you could also define the interaction between Z and other types of spiders or generators of the calculus. So in particular, if you generalize the Hadamard gate to have multiple legs, so instead of just one input and one output, you can have any number of inputs and outputs. This generalization of the Hadamard gate, um, this is for Q dits, this prime Q dit dimension Hadamard generalization. But uh, um, you get that you can have the same bioalgebra rule between Z and H, this generalization of H with any number of wires. And in Q bits, this corresponds to Toffoli plus Hadamard gate set, and for Q prime dimensional Q dates, this exactly corresponds to the Q pit, so prime dimensional Q dip version of Toffoli plus Hadamard gate set. So you can see that uh, this, this diagram of a Hadamard gate followed by the Hadamard dagger gate in a prime Q dip dimension is equal to the multiplication modulo D operation on computational basis states. And you still get this phase kickback of if you have a CCZ gate, it looks like something symmetric with respect to each of the three prime dimensional qubits input. 
So this is a symmetric representation. It doesn't have control or target, but you could choose which one is the target just by con conjugating that wire of the CCZ by a Hadamard and Hadamard dagger to make it a CCX gate. Um, so, um, uh, so I mentioned completeness, which is that any equality of linear maps you can derive using just this finite set of rules on any number of qubits. And we also generalize this completeness results to higher dimensions. So this is quite recent, but if we take the qubit complete, uh, this is for stabilizer, so Clifford, or efficiently classically simulable but non-universal fragment of quantum computation. This left-hand side is just all the qubit rules minus that complicated uh, angles rotating about z and x-axis rule. So this fragment um, for qubits looks like this, and for prime dimensional q dates looks like this. So it's um, this is an, a paper we should put on. We should put on archive soon. But you can see that uh, we're quite. We're quite uh, excited that our generalization to prime dimensional qubits is very clean because it looks just as simple uh, graphically as the qubit version. We can just choose to interpret every diagram in a different prime dimensional qubit dimension. Um, and uh, so this first wave of completeness results, I've kind of really uh, not been uh, not not probably not provide proper justification of how long this took um, because it was quite a big endeavor. If Qubit CX calculus probably is invented around 2008 and this paper comes out in 2018. So it actually took a decade for this first results to come out. And But we are now in a current wave of new completeness results with the first completeness result for any universal fragment of quantum computation beyond qubits, so for multidimensional uh, quantum systems, so qubits. Uh, so for any qubit dimension, doesn't matter if it's prime or not, um, any finite dimension, we have completeness. And this paper we put on archive exactly one month from today ago. Um, and uh, out of these three qubit calculi with the bialgebra rule, one is this ZX calculus, probably the most well-known. Uh, one is the ZH calculus, which corresponds to Toffoli plus Hadamard. And the last one is the ZW calculus. So the ZW calculus, um, uh, yeah. So on the left-hand side is ZX calculus. We already talked about quantum circuit optimization and measurement-based quantum computing, and there's so many other uh, applications, but uh, I don't think it would be too productive to list them all. Um, and then the right-hand side is the ZW calculus. So it's been used for expressing sums and for quantum optics and for other things as well. So for example, uh, if you have a ZX, uh, actually I'll show this on the next slide. So um, we can also take combinations of these calculi uh, just to put different generators into the same calculus and it's still correct. And this um, gives us more accessibility. So this paper is recently is about the ZXW calculus, where we can patch up some of these deficiencies or just less user friendliness that each ZX or ZW calculus respectively has. And um, so our completeness result is built in, is used is uh, proven using this ZXW calculus for any Q dimension. And the ZXW calculus, um, if you were to eliminate W, you get the ZX calculus. And if you were to eliminate all the X spiders, you get the ZW calculus. But you get more than the sum of its parts if you have both ZX and ZW uh, interactions, but you also get some interactions that's kind of between Z and X and W algebras all together. So we call it the trialgebra rule because that's quite fancy naming. Um, so, for example, you can do Hamiltonian exponentiation, exponentiation and you can do exponentiation, differentiation, and summation of these diagrams, um, at least as possible within this formalism. And we have upcoming paper on some of this. So, for example, in quantum machine learning, you may want to find gradients of some certain quantum computations. For example, if you differentiate a parameterized quantum circuit, um, if you do that with ground graphical calculi, of course you get uh, sums of di of these diagrams output, but that becomes problematic because these sums of diagrams 
themselves, this sum operation is external to the calculus, this plus sign that you can't really get rid of, you can't reason about with the rules of the calculus. So in contrast, if you have ZXW calculus, um, then you could express this differentiation of these diagrams without needing to have any sums of diagrams, just as a single diagram. So in this case, uh, this parameterized quantum computation on the left-hand side of this equality, you take the partial derivative with respect to the parameter theta, and then you get on the right-hand side the same diagram, except you have this zone scalar factor and this, uh, this gadget that you attach to the original diagram, which you can then simplify and reason about using the using the calculus. Um, and just to repeat, um, um, all equations derivable for all finite cubic dimensions we can derive with this calculus. So that's some ongoing work, um, but I will just mention as a sneak peek that we have an upcoming paper about photonic quantum computing using the ZXW calculus. So um, <laughs> um, I wish I could say more, but uh, that will come quite soon. Um, that concludes the talk I had prepared, but I'm happy to stick around for questions.